Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to have three extremely powerful leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs in the ad tech industry. Uh, first, Rachel Carson from Guild, uh, which is the leading workforce learning education provider for frontline workers. Steve Daly, the CEO of Instructure, the leading LMS for K-12 higher education, and now also going into the workforce. And Krishna Kumar, the founder and CEO of Simply Learn, which is the leading um, bootcamp model for helping individuals and companies to get workers and individuals ready for digital skills. Uh, I'm Luben Pampolov, co-founder and partner of GSV, and it's uh, really exciting to have this discussion with you all. Uh, maybe to start, Rachel, with you first. Last week, you made an announcement of uh, a name change for the company and also a slightly strategy expansion. It would be great if you can start, out, start us off with that. Sure. So first, nice to see you all. And if you were waiting, that was my fault. We got stuck in the elevator drama happening around, so I apologize. Um, so fortunately for us, we've had a clear roadmap on where we wanted Guild to go from day one. It just takes time to earn the right, especially with the learners we serve, we, we felt, to move into that work. And so where we started and where we still are today is that our, our mission is to unlock opportunity for the American workforce. And we started that work by delivering through education and skilling. And obviously I'm preaching the choir here, but we believe education and skilling are the number one tool of use to unlock opportunity for workers today. What we also believe though, is that it's not wholly sufficient. Like education isn't all that you need to do in order to unlock opportunity and career mobility and career services and career outcomes are the other piece of the puzzle. And so we've been doing that work, but informally for a long time. And so last week we got to announce our career accelerator pro uh, product as well as our advancement and growth in career coaching. And then with that, we dropped education from our name, um, which is a reflection of the fact that education sometimes to folks means formal degrees and more than 50% of what we do today is, is certificates and skilling, but also it just means we're doing more, more than just education and skilling and, and really spending a lot more time thinking about career mobility today. Yeah, and when you think about just uh, how education has evolved, higher education over the last you know, 10, 20 years, I mean, there used to be a specific timeline of you go to college, you know, 18 to 24, and then you graduate and you go into the workforce, I mean, what is the new normal of students today? And you obviously, you know, serve that kind of new normal of people who are, you know, already in the workforce and, and still trying to get educated. Yeah, so we think the four and 40, four years of college, 40 years of work, retirement is dead. And I think the every four is probably the more likely, which is that, uh, you know, uh, workers or employees or learners, they are all the same, right? Those are all titles for the same group are going to need to evolve such that they're acquiring skills on the job constantly, but then probably doing formal reskilling or upskilling on an every four to five year cadence. And for those of us here, I'd imagine most folks here in the knowledge economy, um, but for folks who haven't yet emerged into the knowledge economy, the likelihood of every five year skilling is even greater. Thank you. Krishna, you're targeting people who are typically post, you know, higher education. In some cases, they don't have it, but you're basically preparing them for more relevant work. You're giving them more relevant education for the work that is needed and where there are gaps. And so you partner both with universities and industry partners. Talk about the trends that you're seeing in terms of which content is now more relevant where are we going in the next five to 10 years? Like what's, who's going to be providing the right content to prepare you know, students and learners in the workforce? Yeah, so Lubin, first of all, thanks for the invitation to join this panel. I'm really, really feeling good about sitting with Rachel and Steve. So, and thank you all for joining this uh, uh, talk in the afternoon. So first to give a little bit context of my business, like how, and, and that will also set the context for the answer that I'll give it to you, Lubin. So we started way back in 2009. In 2009, education, skilling, like 
this whole for formal education skills that can help you get a better job those those topics were not under discussion but we are back in 2009 also we saw a trend that there are people who want to who have a, who have an aspiration to grow faster they are, they they want to challenge status quo they are not happy with where they are and we started serving that need and and we evolved our business over a period of time so when we started way back in 2009 it used to be all simply learn programs you want to learn something come we had programs selling under simply learn brand you can learn and you can you can get ahead in your career because you, be, you become smarter than your colleagues and your classmates and and coworkers and then we saw the industry evolving we saw tech players like the likes of google microsoft we were back then cisco they offering their credential in in part of in 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 the form of certification so we started offering those programs and in the last few years i'll say last 5 years in particular we saw a lot of universities who they also want to play in this space that they are offering like four degree program not everybody can afford not everybody has time to do uh, full degree program but they are started offering credentialing so we started partnering with universities in offering those programs and like in us in particular we have 30 university partners all across the us that we co brand our program and take it to the market our model is like engaging interactive deep boot camps and learners take this program because they want to they are not looking at our programs as like good to learn or or be smarter they are looking at our programs because they want to switch their careers either to another company or get into another role so it's a very very deep program and what we see is that there are different kinds of uh, programs that uh, that provide upward mo uh, economic mo mobility to learners of course there are all time favorites like data cyber cloud um, and so on but there are like learners who are trying to learn something as basic as microsoft excel like i was telling to liban just before uh, we, we sat here on the table that one of the biggest selling microsoft curriculum is actually microsoft excel even today even in the age of ai there are people who don't know and if they learn if they get to learn it gives them a lot of uh, like economic mobility in countries outside uh, us or english speaking countries even as basic as speaking english is a skill that can potentially increase their employability by 30 40%. So there are like boot camp providers doing those kind of skills also. So I see at one end things like AI, data, cyber being very very popular, but there are a lot of other skills also which gets added to someone's experience suddenly gives them the economic um, upliftment. For example, project management is still not dead. Still sells a lot. Now imagine somebody who who is, who is a veteran coming out of the workforce and they get project management certified by pmi suddenly it gives them a lot of ability to get meaningful employment yeah and interestingly now with chat gpt you can do everything on excel automated and uh, just by prompting prompting it uh, steve so you're the leading lms in k12 and in higher education i believe it's 40% in k12 30% market share in higher ed you're also international but a more new kind of initiative is you know retraining the workforce and providing tools for that. So talk about just you know what prompted you to get there, to go into that direction, and what is the, the strategy for Instructure? Sure, uh, and um, yeah, thank you for, for having me. Uh, likewise, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be up here. Um, the, the, you know, the, our strategy has always been, look, we're, gonna, we're going to be the infrastructure that is used in the education process, particularly in teaching and learning. And um, what, you know, what our, our strategy really, the way that it, is, is, it hasn't pivoted, but it's evolved, is that um, we're not the only ones that recognize right, this change in learner expectations, right? The universities, right, the, the, the traditional education institutions uh, as well as districts and, you know, K-12 systems are recognizing that um, everybody's not going to go through this path of I'm going to graduate, I'm going to apply through admissions, and I'm going to go to a university, I'm going to go get a four-year degree. There, there's so many different paths. And the way that the universities talk to us about it is there's so many different paths to bring somebody into the university. Right, it's not always through admissions. They may go get a job right out of, right out of high school, and they may want to get a micro credential. I need to stack those, and over time they can get a degree. We're working with ASU on their hundred million learner um, uh, program through Thunderbird, right, where they're they're actually they're offering free courses, you know, to. Uh, they're targeting primarily women in underdeveloped countries, like in in Africa continent, in in particular, to say here's some you know here's get on the path, 
right, and get on this path of education, and wherever it ends up, you may just stop with the personal finance and the things that we're giving you for free, or you may want to get a credential that eventually leads to a degree, or maybe you just want a credential that leads to a great job. And, and so, um, so we've been kind of brought to the table uh, as, you know, as, as universities, as institutions, as high schools are trying to figure out where, what path are they going to take, um, we become that infrastructure to enable uh, whatever pathway a student, a, a learner takes. And so we pick up, you know, we, we, we start with a learner when they enter the, the primary education, right? We're with them through secondary, post-secondary, through vocational, through, uh, you know, we've signed a few deals with companies like PeopleCert in, in, um, in Europe that does a lot, of, a lot of certifications around, you know, plumbing or HVAC or some of these professional certifications with city and guilds in the, the UK that does um, retraining and, and works with the universities. And so it, the, the entire ecosystem recognizes that there's a change in how, you know, how we're going to learn over time as a lifelong learner. And um, it's, it's created opportunity for us, but it, it really is an opportunity um, to reach so many more than just the 17 million higher ed students in the US or the 55 million you know, K-12 students in the US. There's, there, it's such a great opportunity to affect um, society uh, um, on a worldwide basis. Yeah, so as, you, as many of you saw on this uh, summit, we have a pretty big theme around what's going on with generative AI and a lot of sessions are around that. Obviously, this applies extremely a lot on how it might replace a lot of the jobs that exist today. Um, you know, there's uh, some ex estimations by Goldman Sachs recently, recently that 300 million jobs are going to be automated or replaced in the next several years. So talk about, I mean, and, and I was speaking to a lot of the CEOs and founders here, on one hand, there is a lot of excitement, but on the other hand, there's also a lot of paranoia uh, just because it's moving so fast. So talk about each one of you. What do you see as opportunities and potential inflection points for what you're doing with now all of these new LLMs and, and all of this computing power and data points available? Yes, I want, I want to go first. So, I, so my business is like uh, the value that we offer is that there's a lot of content and curriculum available, and we offer expert instruction. So you are a student, you want to learn and make sense of those topics, you don't know where to start, so our instructors will help you, guide you step by step to get, and then you get to a place where, if you want to do incremental learning, you can figure it out on your own. So if AI can do the instruction job, and it is the way the models are moving out, the way the, the kind of good and great things that we see, there is very good chance that a lot of instructions that we provide manually can get automated. So I think still early, we need to see if this really like true to its promise and what percentage of it can be automated. But there are again, there are human elements, right? That's not so easy to implement, right? In, a, a, a great instructor or a great teacher is not only teaching the topic and he's not only making you understand, he also knows like when to stop, when to like, sometimes you don't want technical instruction, sometimes you just want a little bit of motivation that why should you do this program and what can it do to your career, right? So, so those aspects still will have to play. So, so I think education is, 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 is it's very complex, it's not very easy, and I'm sure all businesses have some kind of complexity. So we need to see how AI gets adopted to our industry. But from my perspective, I think it definitely has a, has a big role to play. How, where, and how do we complement? I think that's something that we need to figure it out. On the job loss part, uh, frankly, personally, I'm not that um, concerned that AI is going to take a lot, lot of jobs. My sense is that it will create much more newer jobs that do not exist today, then the number of jobs is going to replace. And it has happened in all big technology revolution that the world has seen in the last many centuries. And do you see universities now knocking on the door and basically asking, oh, we need to adjust the way we provide, you know, the type of content we provide? I mean, Rachel, you as well, you partner with a lot of them. How, what, what are the kind of the trends that you guys see? So, Limon, I, I definitely see that uh, there's much more openness in universities to work with players like us. So earlier universities are looking at us versus them. I'm talking about this five, six years back. But now they're so much open. Like many of them are trying to partner with us. Many of them are trying to do a part of them in-house. So I, I, I think that if something happens, they'll be much more open. They've also realized this value that not everybody can and not everybody should do for 
on campus two three year program because they can't they simply can't afford right so so i think that uh, this is this is best best time to be in this industry because all kinds of players that exist in the industry everybody is, is seeing value in each other and they're open to collaborate the, I agree with much of what Krishna said. I think the one thing that we're thinking about most at Guild is probably less about uh, teaching the learner how to use chat GPT. I mean, the cool thing is, right, we've all seen the charts of the adoption rate. Like, we're, we and every frontline worker we serve at Guild is teaching ourselves how to use the technology. I think the... The industrial revolution element is the part I'm thinking a lot about, because if you think back to the agricultural to the factory uh, revolution or from factory to knowledge economy, if you look at the lineage of a family, in most cases that was a father who's in an agricultural role and there is time and they know for many, many years, often decades, the trend that's coming, which is that the son will go work in a factory. Then the son's in a factory, he has a family of his own, and there were many, many years, programs, GI Bill, you name it, that got the grandson ready to go enter the knowledge economy. That time lag is what I think is different with this trend, and it actually mirrors that same graph. The rate at which technology is changing is so much exponentially faster than the rate at which industrial technology or the original knowledge technology came to market. And what that means is it's no longer the grandfather, the son, and the grandson. One, it's woman. 59% of the folks we serve are female. Higher ed is even higher than that today. But two, she's going to have to upskill in her own lifetime multiple times, especially if she's in the 100 million Americans who does not have a college degree today. She's the most vulnerable. And so what I'm concerned about and what we're having conversations beyond, you know, how do we all use ChatGPT to make our services and products better is actually as we look at where all the disruption is going to happen, how do we take the third of the American populace, happens to be two thirds of the American workforce today, who are most vulnerable to these changes, and how do we give them the chance to reskill on the pace of every four to five years so that they can stay on a path to the middle class, so they can stay employed and have a supportive livelihood until they reach what is now a much later retirement age. And, and just a follow-up question to that, because you have as customers, corporations, um, but when you capture a student, then I assume you can also follow them as they move to, to different corporations, and so essentially you become their um, learning provider for, for a longer time. Yeah, we actually think of the learner uh, or the member, um, learner being somebody who's already completed a program, member being the 10x larger number who are spending time on our platform, maybe using our career services, but not yet enrolled in a formal reskilling program. We think of them as our end customer. Um, and we have very supportive companies who are also rational economic actors and understand most corporations are structured like a pyramid. You've all seen the org chart before, right? And while there are actually enormous numbers of jobs in the middle of the pyramid, it is still a pyramid, not a square or a column. And so companies are very comfortable with the return on investment of supporting an employee for a couple of years, three, four, five, six. And in fact, we ensure our programs always break even in the first year. So if the employee retains one year, you've already paid for the investment into Guild. Um, but they recognize that folks are going to move on. And Lowe's is always my favorite example of that. Lowe's has more cashiers than the world will need for their business multiple years from now. So Lowe's helps their cashiers become plumbers and electricians. Because while Lowe's does not employ plumbers and electricians, the number one problem in, in their business or a top problem is they need more plumbers and electricians in the ecosystem so that when people buy their products, there's someone to install them. So I think we're gonna see more ecosystem-like thinking amongst corporations like that. And I think if we do it right, that's in service of the American employee. Yep, totally agree. Uh, Steve, so you have that window also into Gen Z and you know, students in, in K-12, mm -hmm. but talk about you know, Generative Fair, how that potentially creates inflection points for you, opportunities, and what you're seeing from from the many users that you touch, I believe it's uh, five million. No, uh, it's over thirty. Thirty million. Apologies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that way. Yeah. <laughs> but close. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think um, I think part of the I think part of the opportunity here. Um, so I I'm actually pretty positive about the what's going to happen. Right. I think 
um, you know, back to kind of um, what, what Rachel was talking about with the Industrial Revolution, our whole education system was kind of set up to, to enable um, workers to become industri part of the Industrial Revolution, right? And it's, it's going to, this is going to be that forcing function uh, that says, okay, the way we did it in the past isn't going to work from an education perspective. You know, things as simple as how do we assess knowledge, right? We can't, well, you know, I... Um, you know, there there are. Uh, I was meeting with one of our customers, a big community college down in in Florida. You know, hundred over over a hundred thousand students, um, and the president. She was like, everybody's freaking out about. This was before ChatGPT burst onto the scene, but all those the homework helpers, right? Which is is just ChatGPT, but not scaled, right? And, and so we've dealt with this problem for a long time. Is they're like, you know, they're using it to cheat. And she basically said, look, it's going to happen. Right, we can fight this, or we can figure out how do we how do we do it differently, and how do we how do we educate and assess differently um, moving forward. So I am I'm I'm pretty optimistic that this is going to create a um, a catalyst for us in in how we educate, and I think it's going to be a demand. The Gen Zs that you know in in high school, um, junior high, right? The the what they expect is very different than what I expected when I went through this through the process, uh, and uh, and so and the, and they're much more nimble, right? This idea of learning something every five years is probably too slow for them, right? I they're they're they it's going to be you know much more iterative, I think, with that with with that generation. So I'm pretty I'm pretty optimistic about w what will happen. I think. I think part of our challenge is going to be um, when we talk about when we talk about okay, there's we're, we're going to do skilling, we're going to do that. Um, we always kind of point to well, we, it always comes back to well, how do I know if they have the skills, right? And, and and we always point to well, this is what Walmart's doing, this is what Google's doing, this is what Amazon's doing, right? And so I think for the large fortune 50 companies right they can go figure this out but what about the you know over 50% of the employees in the US that are working at small and medium businesses right they just don't have the ability to 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 um, to you know to, to create those right create a curriculum that they know is going to create skills in the in the workforce that they want to hire and so we've got to figure out how to do this on at, at scale um, you know, there's some stuff that, that you know we've we've experimented with, where I actually think that that GPT is going to help uh, help us create that skills taxonomy and help us be able to scale to more than just the Fortune 50, right? That can afford to do this on their own. So, so I do think o over time this is this is a catalyst for us um, to a much brighter future. Uh, and and uh, we, despite understanding there are going to be dislocations in the in the, in the short term. Yeah, so intelligence around the user and what they can do and connecting more dots than, than previously was, uh, uh, um, you know, able uh, for companies to do, I think. Yes, that's uh, absolutely true. Krishna, so um, you are partly in the, in, in the US, partly in India. I know you're also in some other markets, but talk about the differences between what you're seeing uh, in the Indian market, you know, on higher education and, and workforce learning and then how that how that compares to you know what's going on here in the U.S. also around you know the new trends around generative AI because uh, I mean you know we've been spending a lot of time in India and we do see some some real contrasts um, sometimes but uh, just talk about the differences that you're seeing with Simply Learn. Sure. So uh, Lubin, what I have seen that when it comes to workforce learning, there's a lot of similarity between U.S. and India because some of the largest uh, employers in India are also largest employer in in U.S. like. IBM, Accenture, Bank of America, and so on. So since they have like global teams, they think, and it's like some same project, some some members are here, some members are in India and, and, and other parts of the world. So there's a lot of similarity there. The kind of technology platform that you use, the kind of providers they use are also very, very common. And, and of course, they have, they have some regional... Uh, players doing some needs that are very, very specific to, to that country, like compliance related training or, or, or things of that kind. But I see higher ed very different compared to the higher ed here. So one of the biggest challenge in uh, India, or in general, all the developing countries is that uh, people coming out of the colleges, I'm sure it's partly true here in the US also, they complete the entire program on let's say computer science, but they don't know how to code. So it's like so weird. You spend four years trying to learn the same thing, but you can't write basic code, right? And then you end up going to a, to another uh, another training provider to learn how to code. 
So those things are much more prominent, much more prevalent there. I'm sure it exists in US too. I've seen that kind of thing. Students coming out of a four-year degree program in US and, and signing up at Simply Learn to take basic programs that they, that they should have idly learned as part of the college. So, so that's, the, that's a big difference. Other part that's very, very different is that uh, in, in US, we see that we have all kinds of learners, right? So the market is mature in terms of not only fresh graduate coming to learn program, we see many, many examples of people who are in their mid 40s, they want to switch career and they are open to learn all kinds of technology and, and actually making those shift. But in India, it's a very, very young population. Right? The average billion plus population, but the average age is only tw is around 25 years. So imagine the number of young people that they have. So most of the programs or most of the technology learning or in general workforce learning is focused on how can we help that those young population to get meaningful employment. So huge influx of people who want to take up those kind of programs. There's also a, uh, a trend that you've seen is that uh, like we talked about, like uh, in the past, you complete your, your college, then you go and work for a factory, and then you work throughout your life, and then you retire. Now, if you, it, India is a great place to see how this thought process has completely changed. Like I see a lot of youngster who, want, who wants to work six months, eight months, and they want to switch job because either they don't like the job, they have got bored, or maybe they got some incremental um, better role, which might be just maybe 5% increase in, in their payroll, and then they want to switch on. So the, the so the expectation is that I want to work only for one year, one and a half year, has become pretty much like a, a given and a standard. If you're working in a company for more than two years, and if you're like in early 20s, you're, there's something wrong with you, right? So, so that kind of trend has also come in. And of course, a lot of young people, they want to like experiment with uh, cool things like chat GPT and, and whatnot, right? Like one of the examples that I see is that, in India, I'm sure it must be true in US because India is much often because of the pop population and the number of people that they work. One of the best use cases of chat GPT is how to write a resignation email. So you don't write chat GPT writes, you change your name and you're done. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, Steve, so you're one of the uh, kind of highest value ad tech company on the, on the public market when just looking at you know EV to revenue multiples. Um, but it's interesting, I mean, we did an analysis on like rule of 20, 30, 40, 50 companies that are publicly listed and you guys score at the very top, mm -hmm. you know, both with uh, strong revenue growth but also extremely strong uh, EBITDA margins. Just talk about the, the operational efficiency that you want to achieve and how you combine that with the strategies and, and the, the kind of the growth strategies you have for the company for, you know, the next two three years? Uh, sure. Uh, you know the the model. Um, so you know my my career has been spent uh, primarily in software, and um, it, it's interesting because um, you know the when you when you're in a software business that is targeting a specific vertical like education, right? There's so much domain expertise that you need in order to be successful in that market that it it's almost it almost creates a moat for the horizontal companies have a much harder time coming in right the bigger the bigger companies and so um, the 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 business um, you know the business the business should run very efficiently uh, and I think that's been part of the problem in edtech is um, we've had a lot of small businesses. Um, when they kind of hit the the slowing growth, they don't know how to run it much more efficiently. They either get bought or they you know they end up going out of business. Um, I think we owe it as an industry to create businesses that can live for decades, right? Because you know I know my customers when they come on board, you know can't we've never lost a canvas fully deployed four year higher ed institution has never left canvas in the 12 years that we've been doing this, right? Because they want somebody to be there with them in this process, right? And so I think as an industry, we owe it to our customers to, to create businesses that can endure and be, you know, durable and long, you know, generate cash and, and can be here for the long run and can, you know, weather changes, right, in, in the market. Um, I think that um, there's also this, this belief that, you know, Profitability and growth are opposite ends of of the spectrum, right? Whereas, whereas they they really it's an X Y axis, right? And you can do you can do both. You just have to be really good at decision making. You have to be really close to your customers. You have to be really good at prioritizing where you want to spend that, spend those uh, investments. And then you got to be really sensitive to to customer trends. So, this trend of graduating people, right, that don't know how to code, 
right? So our, our, our customers are recognizing that. So I was just meeting with one of our customers in the Northeast and they said, we want not only to give somebody a, you know, a graduate degree in cyber, for instance, right? But we want them to graduate with a, you know, a, a Cisco certified network engineer credential. And, and we're not gonna do that, but we wanna partner with somebody to, as they, so that they graduate as a, you know, as a whole rounded, rounded student. So I think there's, you know, there, it's, again, I, I'm, I'm super optimistic. I, I'm super optimistic about our ability to, to be creative. Uh, I know education has no, not had this reputation of being fast moving and innovative, right? It, it tends to move slowly, but I think we're in a different world today. And, and I'm pretty excited about what I'm hearing um, is happening out there uh, and how we'll be able to address you know, this, this next couple decades that is going to be dramatic changes. Yeah. And I assume that uh, having, you know, Tom Bravo as a big uh, partner has helped a lot in just the execution side of things. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, I've done a couple companies with Toma. Um, and uh, again, they recognize, I think they recognized early on um, that um, it's really easy because you've got such high gross margins in software and um, because everybody's so focused on growth, it's really easy to run a company, not run a company well and still be successful. And, and so they started to recognize that if, if you just took a, a much more disciplined approach in how you run a, a, a software company uh, and they've been super successful, right? And so, um, so yes, I've, I've learned a ton about how do you run a profitable company that's built to last, gonna be here for, for decades. That's great. Um, to finish, Rachel, just on, on, on your impact, what uh, you're doing. So you're touching more than 5 million employees throughout some of the biggest organizations in the US. How do you think about how you can um, also provide you know, the learning services to as many as possible out of those you know, 5 plus million um, that, that are connected to Guild? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, so within the 5 million that have access to our platform today, I think so much of the conversation is around, one, how do we ensure they know about their company's willingness to pay? I mean, that sounds really basic, but it, there is still a lot of disbelief. The most common question we still get is, is this too good to be true? My company is going to pay for my certificate, my degree, my credential. So we are constantly focusing on what we call awareness. Um, and then really thinking about how do we constantly ensure that any program we're putting them into, um, whether, it, and we triple curate, Guild curates our catalog of schools and programs, the employer then curates, and then ultimately the employee has discretion over if they enroll and what they enroll in. So it's a triple curation process, and we have to stay viciously focused on constantly revising and refreshing that because there are already, as we all know, programs that were relevant five years ago that are not relevant today, and there are increasingly going to be programs that were relevant two years ago that aren't relevant today. So helping schools be very agile in their program, and I, I think at the end of the day, the simplest way to do that is, I can't remember which business leader has that quote of like, at the end of the day, there's two ways businesses get built. They bundle and they unbundle. And I think we are in an era of unbundling. Uh, un and what I mean by that is unbundling the four-year degree, not because that's not incredibly valid, but turning it into stackable credentials and certificates that can amount to a degree for those who stay on that path but still be valuable for those who stack one or two. And so that's where we're spending a ton of time. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you all because you are doing incredible things, each one of you, uh, which are becoming increasingly more important in you know, this new environment we all live in. And um, yeah, great uh, to have you here at the summit. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.